Good. And then finish up uh, a couple slides on new treatment options. Why isn't it good? There we go. So amyloidosis, the word amyloid, first of all, is a misnomer. Um, amyloid comes from um, the word cellulose because when this was, um, this substance was first identified on biopsy specimens in the 1700s, they thought it came from plant material or cellulose, actually it's not. Um, it, it, it involves insoluble material uh, comprised mostly of low molecular weight proteins of various sizes. Um, up to 37 different proteins have been identified, and they form these very discrete, um, unique fibrils that are insoluble and glom up in extracellular spaces, causing or organ dysfunction. We'll go over that. On H&E biopsies, these look like amorphous hyaline material. And by definition, um, with Congo Red, Congo Red, by the way, is just an old a cotton wool dye substance. Um, under um, a polarized scope, the material turns apple green, which is a classic board's question. All right, so um, amyloid, the structure, it looks like this beta, twisted beta pleated sheet, uh, very unique. Um, all amyloid looks like that, the either AL, AA, uh, TTR, we'll go over all that. And by definition, it looks like this hyaline amorphous stuff and under um, polarized uh, imaging or a scope rather, the Congo red, uh, it, looks, it looks green. And the reason for that is this cotton wool dye Congo red, um, for reasons back there why, it intercalates between the beta pleated sheets right here. Um, and when it does that, if you then stain, if you look at this rather uh, through a, a polarized scope, the um, wavelength of the light changes and it turns green. So how do we get to amyloid? There's a lot of different mechanisms for amyloid to form. Um, in simple terms, it may be due to an overproduction of a protein um, that's a normal protein that's overproduced or production of a misfolded or mutated abnormal protein. So amyloid may be made up of predominantly light chains and the nomenclature A stands for amyloid, and the next letter is the subtype. So the old term for AL amyloid was primary amyloid. It's now called AL amyloid. Um, that's the most common type. Or inflammatory proteins, such as protein A in secondary or AA type, or misfolded proteins, the classic example being ATTR, or transthyretin, we'll be talking about a little bit can be either localized or systemic. We'll be focused on systemic. And far and away, the most common in the United States is the AL type, which is due to an underlying plasma cell clonal proliferation. Um, I ripped this off from Robbins and Cotran, uh, their uh, a past textbook. It pretty much in picture says the same thing. The way you get to the fibrils here, different pattern, different mechanisms, either production, um, uh, abnormal production of proteins as from a plasma cell dyscrasia with AL or from chronic inflammatory states uh, with, it, with interleukins cranked up, particularly IL-1 and 6, which makes the uh, hepatocytes uh, overproduce the SAA protein. Or you can have not overproduction but just accumulation of an abnormal protein that can't be uh, destroyed as much. And that classic example there is the ATTR protein. Um, this is a series from the Mayo Clinic, which goes over the distribution of various subtypes of amyloid, and you can just see a large group, over 5,000 patients. The Mayo, as you'll see again and again, is kind of the mecca for AL amyloid um, in the country, if not the world. 73% um, of their patients with amyloid, granted it's a referral center, but the vast majority were AL subtype. So some of the other ones to talk about the AA type, uh, the fibrils here are composed, again, of acute phase reactant, um, the uh, amyloid A protein. You see these in any chronic inflammatory state, classically um, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, um, Mediterranean fever, certain cancers. Uh, for reasons that aren't clear, this amyloid protein tends to glom up in the glomeruli or in the kidneys uh, as opposed to the heart. 
Um, another one that's um, becoming very um, important to, to note, uh, particularly for those of you in cardiology, is the senile uh, or systemic amyloid, or the, the, the new term is wild type ATTR, in which there's an accumulation of the TTR protein um, with other proteins, and this forms an amyloid fibril in the heart. These patients have wild type TTR genes. Um, the, for reasons that aren't clear, in some people, um, when they age, this accumulates in the heart. Um, has a male predominance, uh, traumatic male predominance, 25 to 50 to 1, and most of this uh, involves the heart, as they said. In fact, there's autopsy data showing <clears throat> that in patients over age 70, about 25% of people over age 70 will have evidence for accumulation of wild type of TTR amyloid in their heart, but only about 5% of those patients actually have cardiac dysfunction. You can also see carpal tunnel syndrome in these patients, and renal involvement is quite rare. There's also localized amyloid um, in which you can get, usually this is the AL type um, with uh, immunoglobulin light chains, like involving the skin, the bladder, the lungs, pretty uncommon. And um, inherited amyloid, um, these are mutations which, again, result in protein products that result in abnormal misfolding of the protein, and they get amyloid fibril fibr uh, formation. There's a lot of different mutations. The most important one to keep in mind is TTR, but the other ones are as listed. Um, the TTR amyloid patients, again, have an infiltrative cardiomyopathy. The ones who have the inherited mutation um, as opposed to senile uh, TTR um, or wild type tend to have peripheral neuropathy and carpal tunnel syndrome. And you should keep this in mind, and I'll go over this um, later. Um, this is one of the variants is quite have a, a pretty high prevalence in African-American men with CHF over the age of 60. Um, and I'll explain why that's important in a minute. Um, there may also be dialysis-associated amyloid. This is due to um, beta-2 microglobulin uh, combining with other proteins. Uh, for reasons that are unclear, this amyloid protein tends to accumulate um, in musculoskeletal areas, skeletal areas, particularly the scapula humeral, a rotator cuff, um, carpal tunnel, and in the neck. But we'll focus the rest just on AL amyloid, which, again, is the most common type of amyloid you would see and should know about. Uh, these patients, by definition, have an underlying clonal plasma cell disorder. And again, immunoglobulin light chains, either kappa or lambda, combine with other proteins to form amyloid fibrils. Um, unlike other pa patients with other monoclonal uh, gammopathies or plasma cell disorders, particularly MGUS, patients with AL amyloid tend to be lambda light chains as opposed to kappa. Remember that about two-thirds of patients with monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance um, are kappa-related, um, whereas with AL amyloid, it flips three-fourths are lambda. The way I, I always forget that, but the way I remember it is lambda loves amyloid. Not exactly fitting, but anyway. Um, the lambda light chains, especially there's a subtype six, uh, tend to be amyloidogenic. Not clear why that is. So how do we make the diagnosis of AL amyloid? Um, this requires these four findings. You have to have all four. And this is um, the latest International Myeloma Working Group criteria, which is sort of our, 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 our guidelines, um, standard guidelines. First of all, they have to have an amyloid-related systemic syndrome, i.e., if you have somebody with renal failure, you can't be chalking it off to diabetes or hypertension, obviously. Two, you have to have biopsy-proven amyloid. I've had a lot of referrals, when I used to work at Metro anyway, for patients with amyloid without any biopsy to prove it. You have to have a biopsy proof with Congo red staining, as I said, in any tissue specimen, or you could get um, amyloid fibrils on electron microscopy, generally not needed. Third, you have to have proof of a light chain related, that it's light chain related amyloid. The gold standard for proving that the subtype of amyloid, uh, remember all those types I mentioned, you have to prove that it's light chain, is mass spec. Mass spectrometry, I'll go over in a minute, um, is the gold standard. It's usually done at the Mayo Clinic. You have to send it out. You could also use immunoelectron uh, microscopy. Generally, mass spec is the standard. And the fourth is you have to have proof of a monoclonal plasma cell proliferative disorder. So we'll go over this, but you have to have either a positive SPEP or UPEP over an abnormal free light chain. 
um, assay or a clonal uh, uh, plasma cells on a bone marrow aspirate biopsy. So those four, you got all four. So we'll unpack this a little bit. How do we make a diagnosis of amyloid? I already went over that. Um, the biopsy of just amyloid itself to prove its AL type. A lot of different ways you can do that. Immunohistochemical stains are what um, most pathologists start off with. The problem with that is that, as I'll show you, the clone of plasma cells and production of capra lambda are usually pretty small, and so you can miss that on an IHC. Also, um, the, the, the clone of plasma cells be, may be masked by an inflammatory polyclonal plasma cell production. So IHC isn't so hot. Isn't that great? Immunoelectron microscopy on renal biopsies, pretty sensitive, 71%. Um, for kappa, 83% for lambda. Immunofluorescence on renal biopsies, about two-thirds sensitive. And again, mass spec is the gold standard. Um, and you have to send it away, usually to the Mayo Clinic. And they will send it here. This is just a, an example. So this is a glomerulus with Bowman's capsule. So this is an H&E, patient with um, renal involvement, Congo red, polarized scope, turns green. Then you go immunofluorescence here. So you prove that there's, there's lambda staining and there's no kappa, so there's light chain restriction. Um, if you go further, you could do um, electron microscopy, which proves that it's amyloid. You're going to have to take my word for that. And then they can do immunostaining. The little uh, tiny black dots are um, uh, immunoelectron microscopy staining for a lambda, and there's kappa. So it's positive for lambda and negative for kappa. So what, if you have somebody, after I go over all of these different clinical manifestations, who you're suspicious may have AL amyloid, what organ should you biopsy? Well, it turns out um, the sensitivity of bone marrow aspirate and biopsy, which is what most people start off with, is about 50-50. So it's okay. Fat pad biopsy sensitivity is between 70 and 80%. But if you combine a bone marrow biopsy and a fat pad biopsy, um, you'll be positive in one of those two in 90% of cases. This is data from the Mayo Clinic. Um, it's not standard practice at a lot of centers, but at the Mayo Clinic for years, they've been pushing for um, centers to do bone marrow biopsies and then flip the patient over and do an anterior fat pad biopsy at the same time. We haven't done that here since I've been here, but it's something that a lot of centers do um, because you'll increase the yield up to 90%. If you have proof of amyloid on either of those, if the patient, let's say, has cardiac involvement based on other imaging, I'm going to say, you don't have to biopsy the heart as well. But if both of those are negative, um, then you do have to biopsy, obviously, the organ. You'd want to go where the money is, so to speak, and biopsy the organ involved. So how do we prove that there's a clonal plasma cell proliferation? So you have to order these tests. So I'll go over all. It's an SPAP, 24-hour UPAP, IFE, FLC, and the, the plasma cell uh, clonality in the marrow. So uh, just going back to basics, this is a normal serum protein electrophoresis. So all an SPEP is, and I know you all know this, but just to reiterate, it's very easy. You just take the patient's serum, the acellular component of blood after a clot, and you put it in an electrophoretic gel, and it just goes between positive and negative electrodes. And the, the various proteins migrate at different rates. So normally you don't you see have a whole bunch of different sizes of proteins, polyclonal. And they call these different regions different names, beta, gamma, doesn't matter. In, in a patient who has a monoclonal plasma cell proliferation like down here, these guys are all the same, attack of the clones. They're making one pure monoclonal protein. It migrates at one level, and so the dense atometry tracing above is real narrow. We call it an M spike or a church spire. And so that's a monoclonal protein. The problem with SPEPs is they're not that sensitive so they're only accurate down to, well, two problems. One, they, they only are accurate down to around 0.5 grams per deciliter, generally, um, number one. And, and number two, you can well imagine if you have light chains, they're light, hence the name, light chains. <laughs> so they migrate really fast on electrophoretic gel, so you're going to miss them. So a more sensitive test is an immunofixation electrophoresis, in which you take the gel after an SPEP, and then you add anti seria to the proteins in the gel, they're basically trapped in the gel. So you have radio amino assays to the heavy chains, IgG, IgA, and IgM, and the light chains, kappa and lambda. And so where they light up, that means you have a monoclonal protein. So here you have an Ig, you have a kappa band, and it's IgA, so it's IgA kappa. 
right? When you see a little tiny spike here on the SPEP, you might miss that. This is way more sensitive. It's down to, IFEs can pick up M proteins down to around 0.1 or less, so they're much more sensitive. It, and um, where I used to work, they wouldn't do them unless there was a positive SPEP. Here, I'm pleased to see, when I started here, you can click, uh, you can get an IFE even if the SPEP is negative. So um, most patients who have amyloid, as I said, don't have big M proteins. Um, so they said it might be missed on an SPEP or a UPEP. Oh, and by the way, to complete the loop, if you're going to do a, um, a urine protein electrophoresis, you want to do a 24-hour UPEP. Patients hate that. Uh, doctors hate it because the pain in the neck, the nurses hate it because pain in the neck ordering and collecting urine for 24 hours. The reason for that, there was a study done at the Mayo Clinic many years ago, um, we know that um, the secretion or production of light chains can be sporadic, and so if you do a spot urine, you might miss it. So you've got to collect it for 24 hours. So anyway, um, because these patients produce a, a small num a amount of M proteins, you can miss in about a third of patients on an SPEP or UPEP. And again, uh, the, the, the M protein can be obscured by normal immunoglobulins in the blood or by albumin in the urine. Um, so if you look at um, patients uh, who at the Mayo Clinic who were screened for a monoclonal protein who had AL amyloid, if you got an SPEP and an IFE, 24-hour UPEP and a urine F IFE, about 90% of patients will have a monoclonal protein. So if you get all of those, 90% of them are going to find a monoclonal plasma cell discrete. And this is from Maury Gertz, who's one of the gurus of amyloid in the United States. Uh, this is from an old paper, but I thought it was still useful. This just shows you the distribution, again, at the Mayo Clinic, of their, um, their monoclonal proteins in their patients' AL amyloid. And you can see they're not very big. So, you know, 25% of them on SPEP didn't have anything. Uh, this is, these are SPEP data, I should say. Um, and, um, and IFE, I should say. Um, and most of them were even under 1.5. A lot of them were under 0.5. And again, they usually were either free uh, lambda or IgG lambda. In the urine, um, these patients spill a lot of protein. As you'll see, um, a lot of it is not light chains. A lot of it's albumin, and that's called nephrotic range proteinuria I'll get into. But if, they, if you do pick up light chains, it's usually lambda. And then the, the, the more recent, recent being the last decade, 15, 10, 15 years, uh, the test on the scene is the, the free light chain assay, which just assays for free kappa and lambda. Um, about a third of amyloid patients only have light chains, light chain only. It's a little higher than you'd see in myeloma. In myeloma, that number is about 10%, so it's a little greater. Um, and this will be, these guys will produ produce light chains detected by the CRM FLCH re uh, assay. Abnormal, importantly, is defined by an elevation of either the kappa or the lambda, plus you've got to have an abnormal kappa to lambda ratio. A real common reason um, we will get consults is for a patient with renal failure who has an abnormal FLC ratio. Remember the, no the normal ratio, you have a kappa to lambda ratio upper of about 1.6 or so, so it's almost 2 to 1 kappa to lambda, roughly. Um, in patients who have renal failure, um, because of the physical chemical property of kappa as opposed to lambda, when your kidneys uh, shut down, um, kappa goes up out of proportion to lambda. And so it's not uncommon for anybody with renal failure to have an abnormal capital lambda ratio. So, and there's some studies that show the capital lambda ratio may be as high as four in patients with renal failure. So just keep that in mind. But if you have somebody where the capital lambda ratio is flipped, and it's a lambda way out of portion of kappa, that's almost always a plasma cell disorder, either amyloid or myeloma. So um, if you look at the FLC um, sensitivity, it's about 91%, again, from the Mayo. Um, when they combined all those tests I mentioned on the previous slide plus an FLC, nearly 100% of their AL amyloid patients who were confirmed by mass spec had an abnormal finding. So if you do all these tests plus an FLC, you're almost always going to pick up something. Uh, conversely, the um, uh, negative predictive value is really high. So if you have somebody who you think has AL amyloid and all of these tests are negative, pretty much excluded AL amyloid. Um, it's important you know that the, the difference between AL amyloid and other plasma cell dyscrasias, particularly MGUS and myeloma. 
So MGUS, by definition, these patients have a serum or urine M protein without symptoms or signs of end organ failure or, or findings, and they have no evidence of AL amyloid. So if somebody has, is labeled as MGUS and you get a, a renal bi or a, a bone marrow biopsy and there's, there's amyloid on the staining, that ain't MGUS, that's AL amyloid. I've had people ask me that a lot, it's not. Um, importantly, patients with MGUS may go on to develop systemic amyloid, and that's one of the reasons we follow MGUS patients. They may also go on to develop um, myeloma or lymphoma. A multiple myeloma, which the WHO now calls plasma cell myeloma, um, that's so the pathologists justify their existence to change the names every few years. Um, patients who have myeloma, about 10, some studies up to 15% of patients who have myeloma may have concomitant AL amyloid, and we've all seen that in the myeloma world. But the converse isn't true. Patients who have a diagnosis of AL amyloid very rarely go on to develop myeloma. In fact, uh, a pa recent paper from the Mayo Clinic, again, they looked at 1,000 patients of theirs who they followed for 20 years. Only 0.4% went on to develop myeloma. So the diagnostic criteria for myeloma, you have to have all three. And this changed a lot over the years. Now it's pretty straightforward. The first two are easy. The third one's a little tricky. So you have to have a serum or urine monoclonal protein. You have to have a clonal plasma cytosis defined by either flow or um, a light chain restriction by uh, IHC, or in an extramedullary plasma cytoma. That, those two are real easy. And the third is ROTI, or related organ tissue impairment. So um, the way you remember ROTI, the old name uh, acronym was CRAB, which stood for hypercalcemia, renal impairment from no other cause, anemia from no other cause, or bone lesions, usually lytic bone lesions. Um, they used to also include amyloidosis in there. Amyloidosis doesn't count as a myeloma-defining event any longer. Um, um, but they also added these other criteria called SLIM. Um, so SLIM crab are the myeloma-defining events. I didn't come up with those names. They're kind of ridiculous. And these are hard to remember, I, I admit. It's kind of annoying. So the other ones are the S stands for 60% marrow clonal plasma cytosis. The LI is a free light chain involved to uninvolved, so kappa to lambda or lambda kappa to ratio over 100, and the absolute level has to be over 100, by the way, uh, milligrams per liter. Or more than one focal lesion on MRI, usually whole body or uh, spine. Any of these is called an, a myeloma-defining event. So if you have any of those, even if you don't have a CRAB criteria plus the first two, you got myeloma, okay? When this first came out, I thought, I'm never going to see this. If someone doesn't have crab and has one of these, picky things, and I saw two in a month. And the reason they chose these, they didn't pluck them out of thin air, um, the International Myeloma Working Group looked at um, patients over the years who didn't meet criteria for myeloma but had one of these three, and their, their risk for progression was only 50% in a year. So they do have myeloma, and that's a slim crab. So, I, don't remember that. I don't know what that is, an anorectic crab, I guess. So um, what about this? I'm getting into the weeds here a little bit. What about patients who have AL amyloid? They don't meet the criteria for slim crab. So they don't have a myeloma fine event. But they have over 10% plasma cells. So they're not myeloma, but they're kind of what, they're in between. We don't know what to call that. They do have a worse prognosis than patients who have less than 10% plasma cells. Most experts in the myeloma world recommend they be treated like myeloma, but we don't really know. So that's still up in the air a little bit. And this is from the Mayo, the, the, the median percent plasma cells in their AL patients was 7%, and you can see the breakdown. Not very many had over 10%. It was like maybe 20%. To complete the loop, um, not surprisingly, because plasma cells, remember, are end-stage B cells, right? And B cell uh, development, they're the, the guys at the very end. Um, so the other cells in... B cell development can also produce immunoglobulin, right? And those cells can go awry and become malignant, and we call those B cell lymphomas. So B cell lymphomas may also be associated with some forms of AL, with AL amyloidosis. This is uncommon. Usually it's not IgG, it's an IgM, M protein. Usually it's associated with Waldenstrom's, or we call that lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, or non-Hodgkin lymphoma, not otherwise specified. There have been rare case reports of CLL. I may have one now that we're managing, or follicular lymphomas, but they're pretty uncommon. 
Okay, so AL amyloidosis, um, pretty rare disorder. Um, the incidence, actually it's hard to find an actual number. Um, it's about 2,200 new cases per year. Uh, there's not a good registry data for this. It's about one-fifth as common as multiple myeloma. The prevalence, though, is 12,000 in the U.S. as of 2015. It's rising. The median age of diagnosis is 63, similar to myeloma, a little bit younger, and it's quite rare to have somebody under age 40. This is from a paper in Blood Advances um, looking at uh, real-world uh, registry data, excuse me, um, claims data, and you can see in the top panel um, the prevalence has gone slowly up because people are living longer, because our treatments are getting better, I'll show you. The incidence, relatively flat, a little bit higher. So the clinical findings, um, again, it's due to the, um, uh, the amyloid protein glomming up extracellularly. There's no inflammatory response that's elicited. The most common symptoms are actually weight loss, fatigue, or lightheadedness. Uh, really vague, but those are the most common ones. There was recently on the web, actually, a, um, a blogosphere um, in a, 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 a AL amyloid survivors, and they did a survey to see how, how long it took for them from time of symptoms to get a diagnosis. Two-thirds of the patients surveyed, and this was several hundred patients across the U.S., had symptoms for over six months before they were diagnosed. Half had symptoms for over a year. And as I'll go over, you'll see why the symptoms are often really vague, and it's not something you often think of. So a lot of different organs can be involved. The two biggies you should keep in mind are the kidney and the heart. So um, in some series, this is the most commonly involved organ. In some, it's second. It's right up there with the heart. Basically, the action occurs in the glomerulus here and results in the glomerulonephritis, which causes a nephrotic range proteinuria in about half of the patients. And with that, you can get elevated cholesterol and peripheral edema. These patients um, often will have a normal renal function testing. Um, End-stage renal disease develops in about 20%, though. Just to complete the loop, uh, the amyloid protein can also glom up vascular or tubular areas. Those patients tend to have uh, CKD uh, and less proteinuria because the glomerulus isn't involved. Um, a misnomer that um, I was taught when I was a lot of people's ages out there, many moons ago, that if you have someone with amyloid, they had huge kidneys, get an ultrasound. If it's big, they got amyloid. No, that's not true. The, a series at uh, the Mayo Clinic, again, looked at this, and they didn't see that at all. Um, a little clinical pearl to keep in mind, if you have a non-diabetic adult with nephrotic range proteinuria, 10% of those patients have AL amyloid, so keep that in mind. And so with nephrotic syndrome, you can get, you know, pitting edema, lower extremities, sometimes full-blown anisarcal. That's not as common. And the, the renal biopsy, again, it's classically a glomerular uh, disorder spilling uh, nephrotic range proteinuria. And I didn't mention this, I put a slide on this, I just realized, if you have a patient with myeloma who has um, renal failure and you get a 24-hour UPEF and it's mostly albumin, that should send off alarm bells that that's not myeloma kidney, that's probably amyloid or a rarer disorder called light chain deposition disease. And that's important because that would affect whether or not you're going to send a patient for transplant. Um, cardiac findings, um, you should know that these misfolded light chains, particularly the lambda light chains, can be directly toxic to cardiomyocytes. And most importantly, you should know far and away the heart, whether there's involvement of the heart, um, affects the prognosis more than any other organ. I'll show you some data on that in a minute. These patients classically have a restrictive cardiomyopathy and may present with uh, predominantly right-sided heart failure. They can have a, a low cardiac output, but that's usually a later finding. They classically present with fatigue, lower extremity edema, JVD, ascites, shortness of breath. Um, they may have syncope or presyncope. Um, sudden death is actually not uncommon. Unfortunately, last year when I started here, we lost a patient with new, new uh, male amyloid from sudden cardiac death before he ever got any treatment. Um, and just to complete the loop, for any of you out there in Zoom world um, going to cardiology, rarely amyloid can affect the coronary arteries, heart arteries and cause ischemic heart disease, but that's quite rare. The echo findings on um, AL amyloid, they classically will have normal ejection fraction with a thickened intraventricular septum. Normally it's up to around 12 millimeters. In these patients it may be 15 millimeters or more. 
and the ventricles can be thickened, sometimes thickening of the um, AV valves. Um, on echo, you may see decreased global longitudinal strain or GLS pattern, which spares the apex. It's pretty specific for amyloid. Um, about 40% of AL amyloid po patients will, you can see it on echo, so it's not that sensitive. About 20% will have CHF. Um, something that comes up on the boards, although we don't see this very often clinically, on EKG you may see um, low voltage or you may see a pseudo-infarction pattern. So low voltage here, um, by definition you have um, the QRS amplitude is less than 5 millimeters in the limbs, limb leads, or 10 millimeters in the precordial leads. But remember it's nonspecific and there's a host of other causes listed there including obesity, subcutaneous emphysema, severe hypothyroidism, etc. And this just shows the intraventricular septum is really thickened, as can be the, um, they, can, they can mimic LVH too. Um, cardiac MRI is um, a lot more sensitive than an echo. Um, there's a, a very characteristic appearance on late gadolinium enhancement in patients who have uh, amyloid. The sensitivity for late gadolinium enhancement is 85%, uh, specificity of 92%, for amyloid, but it can't separate or distinguish what subtype of amyloid, so you'd have to get a biopsy unless you have another tissue biopsy. Um, another test um, that's very sensitive is cardiac scintigraphy with bone tracers. There's a lot of different tracers out there. Um, usually involves technetium. The one used here, I believe, is PYP. Um, it's particularly accurate for uh, transthyretin um, cardiac amyloid with a sensitivity of 82%, 98% specificity in one study recently published. And so what do you do if you're considering cardiac amyloid in a patient, whether you think it's AL or not, um, based on clinical findings or echo? Um, if a patient has heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and doesn't have coronary ischemia, um, first you look for monoclonal protein based on those other tests I, I, sent, I mentioned. Um, if there is a monoclonal protein, you've got to get a tissue biopsy, bone marrow biopsy, fat pad, all negative, get to go for the heart. If there is no monoclonal protein, okay, then if the cardiac scintigraphy is consistent with amyloid, actually you don't have to get a biopsy. Um, then you would check uh, for the DNA mutation for TTR to determine if they have either hereditary or wild type or senile um, amyloid, ATTR, okay? And I put a reference here. This just came out in one of our hematology journals, uh, Blood, just last year. Um, a little caveat. Remember that as we age, um, it's quite common to have MGUS, particularly in African Americans. Um, as you get above age 70, somewhere around 4 or 5% of us will have MGUS. In African Americans, we don't exactly know what the number is, but it's probably 7% or more. And so it wouldn't be that uncommon for an older uh, person, particularly an African-American, to have coexistent MGUS. So actually there was a study done um, at the Mayo Clinic in which they looked at patients who were sent to them with, quote, AL amyloid, um, and then looked, dug deeper by mass spec and other testing. Ten percent of them actually had inherited uh, mutations, a lot of them TTR. Why is this important? Because it's, you could have somebody who has a TTR mutation who ha or senile TTR, uh, wild type, who just has incidental MGUS. So you don't want to expose those patients to toxic chemo, obviously. So you don't want to miss this. So amyloid in the liver, um, it's common for these folks to have an enlarged liver, about 70%, but there's a lot of mechanisms. They have right heart failure. Um, only about 15% of symptomatic actual amyloid in the liver. Classically, they have an elevated ALK-FOS, um, they have nonspecific anorexia that really satiety. Portal hypertension is quite rare. Progressive liver failure, only about 5%. And this is something that I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, Dr. Gertz has been mentioning this for years at national meetings. If you see somebody with evidence of hyposplenism, so how old jolly bodies in the peripheral blood smear, in the setting of a really large liver, apparently from their studies, this was originally published some 30 years ago, it's very specific for amyloid involving the liver. Um, amyloid in the gut, AL amyloid, um, study from Japan on all patients who had AL amyloid got stomach biopsies for some reason. 90% of those patients had a positive gastric biopsy. 
but it rarely had symptoms. It's sort of an incidental finding. The G, you can get a whole host of GI syndromes, uh, but they're more commonly seen in the nine AL subtypes. They get GI bleeding from gut involvement, vascular friability. They can get malabsorption, uh, chronic dysmotility from nerve involvement. And importantly, they may also get a protein-losing gastroenteropathy. I just like to bring that up because when I was a resident here a very long time ago, in this room, um, they did M&Ms, and uh, they presented an unknown. And Dr. Naff, I don't know if you're out there, Dr. Naff, but I'll give you <laughs> props. Nobody knew what the patient had. It had an albumin of like 0.8. Everything was negative. He raised his hand. He said, has anyone considered amyloid involving the gut? And he was right. So keep that in mind. Um, the uh, amyloid can also involve muscles and the tongue. Classically, when you're in med school, you always see patients with big tongue and amyloid. Actually, it's only seen in around 10% of cases um, in the biggest series that I could find. Sometimes, and I haven't seen that. I have seen lateral scalloping of the tongue from impinging of the teeth. Um, you can also get amyloid depositing in joints or surrounding muscles, the so-called shoulder pad sign. Just show you some pictures. So macroglossia, scalloping of the tongue, shoulder pad sign. Um, nervous system can be involved as well. Um, about 20% of patients have a mixed sensory motor peripheral neuropathy. Um, they have numbness, paresthesias. Often it resembles diabetic neuropathy. Um, you usually have to go all the way to a sural nerve biopsy to make the diagnosis to prove that amyloid is involved here. Um, in one study, the median time from symptoms to diagnosis, because people think of all these other things, was two years. Um, you can get autonomic neuropathy in about 15% of patients with bowel or bladder dysfunction. So any neurologists out there, keep this in mind. And they may present with orthostatic hypotension. So if you have somebody with orthostatic hypotension, you can't explain, keep that in mind. And of course, carpal tunnel syndrome, amyloid tends to accumulate, cause um, a median nerve compression. Um, since Dr. Nyack is sitting in the audience, I have to bring up the COAG system. And as luck would have it, they had a case at a benign heme conference yesterday that may have this, which I couldn't believe. Um, so the COAG system um, can be involved with amyloid. Um, traditionally, I was always taught you think of factor 10 deficiency because factor 10, um, for some reason, tends to be absorbed by um, the AL amyloid protein into tissues and it gets sucked up. There's a lot of other mechanisms too. That's actually not that common. This is the biggest study I could find. It's from about 20 years ago. They looked at 337 patients um, in Great Britain with uh, AL amyloid um, and looked at bleeding problems. Abnormal bleeding was seen in about a third. They had abnormal coag tests in almost half. The most common finding was a prolonged thrombin time, which Dr. Ratnoff would be looking down saying, a, thr a thrombin time is basically a functional fibrinogen assay. In about a third, it was the most common finding, and a, pro a prolonged uh, prothrombin time at 24%. The reason uh, these patients have a prolonged thrombin timing, we were debating yesterday, it's not clear from what I could find. It's multifactorial. Probably there's dysfibrinogenemia from the, al from the um, AL amyloid screwing up the fibrinogen. Um, patients have often have hypoalbuminemia from nephrotic syndrome or liver involvement, and that affects um, the fibrinogen. Um, but so there's a lot of mechanisms. Again, factor 10 deficiency, they didn't see it was that common, it was like 14%, although we always think of that. And these patients can also bleed more commonly, not from a coagulation defect, but just from friability of blood vessels, which are involved with, um, with amyloid in the gut or the skin. And this poor guy said his picture taken several times. So you can, you can have what's called PPPP, so post-proctoscopic periorbital purpura. So the patient's bending over for a rectal exam, and it causes, with a valsalva, the pressure pushes out, and you can get purpura like a raccoon eyes. You can get skin involvement with purpura or direct amyloid involvement on this guy's foot, for instance. And this just shows you the breakdown. This was a series from Italy looking at over 1,000 AL patients. Again, heart and kidney, two most common, a big drop-off, and these other organs we talked about. Um, about 80% of patients will have one or two involvement. It's less common to have uh, three, patients, three organs involved. Okay, what about prognosis? So 
Um, the prognosis we've known for years in AL amyloid is dependent upon heart involvement, and how you assay that has been under some debate for 30 years. But we now know the extent of light chain production also correlates, not surprisingly, because it, it reflects how much of a tumor burden or plasma cell clone there is with, survive, with uh, pro prognosis. So the most recent updated Mayo Clinic staging system involves um, three AS bioassays. The troponin T, that's not your usual troponin you order when you really are an MI. It, it's a more sensitive marker. It has to go out. It's a send out test. The uh, N-terminal pro, uh, B, pro BNP, it's actually far more sensitive than your standard BNTP. Um, and the free light chain difference, so the difference between kappa and lambda. All right. Based on those three tests, you get one point based on these numbers. Um, so if the troponin T is over 0.025, the NT pro B and P is over 1,800, or the, the FLC difference is over 18, you get a point for each one of those. And then if you have zero, it's stage one, et cetera. If you have all three, you're stage four. Um, and this was published about eight years ago by Saji Kumar at the Mayo Clinic, and you can see how the survival breaks down pretty clearly between those subtypes. And so again, what's driving this is how much is the heart involved and how much of a plasma cell proliferation is it. So the treatment, just finish up with a couple of slides here, um, just to expose you to some of this. Um, unfortunately, amyloid, like um, most plasma cell disorders, is generally incurable. The old standard um, up until 10 years or so ago was amelphalan, which is an oral alkylating agent, and dexamethasone. Um, uh, there was a study done 20 years ago where they compared colchicine, which had some efficacy, to this regimen, and the median survival was better with meldex, but it was only 18 months median, pretty bad. Um, the newer uh, drug on the scene, uh, which was extrapolated over from the myeloma world, is bortezomib. And when you combine bortezomib with um, another uplet agent, cyclophosphamide and decadron, the slang is Cyborg D, given once a week, very easy. Much higher response rates than melphalan and decadron. In the most recent study, it wasn't randomized, uh, from Great Britain looked at uh, a 915 patient cohort uh, who received bortezomib based Cyborg D type regimens, median survival of 72 months. So that's been the stand. This is, this is the. Uh, Dr. Kyle's study looking at uh, melphalan and prednisone versus colchicine improved survival, but it's still pretty poor. And this is the more recent study using bortezomib-based regimens. I'm committing a cardinal sin in oncology comparing across trials, but this is pretty dramatic. And so our bortezomib-based regimens such as Cyber-D have been the standard induction regimen, I would argue, for the last probably five years, five to ten years, in the U.S. at least. What about a stem cell transplant? So we know that um, high-dose chemotherapy followed by an autologous stem cell rescue improves overall survival in myeloma. We've known that for 30 years, 20, 30 years. And um, non-randomized trials um, without a, a comparator arm in AL amyloid suggested that high-dose chemotherapy was beneficial, but it often wasn't tolerated because they have so many end organs involved, the kidney, the liver, the heart. Um, so there was finally a randomized trial in which they compared melphalan and decadron, which was the standard, to MEL200 or melphalan at 200 milligrams per meter squared, followed by autologous stem cell rescue. And surprisingly, there was no difference in survival. In fact, I'll show you the curve, there was a decrement in survival in the transplant arm, which scared everybody. Um, but the reason for that was because there was an, a quarter of the patients um, had treatment-related mortality. I mean, they died within 100 days of the stem cell transplant, which was really unacceptable. And here's the, this is from the New England Journal, you know, 13, 14 years ago. Not what was hoped for, unfortunately. Well, the Mayo Clinic group, again, went back and said, well, wait a minute, it's, this may be because these patients were not, well, they, they were poorly selected. And they included a lot of patients who probably shouldn't have gotten a transplant, frankly. So they went back and looked at their data set and found that patients, they looked at their patients who had a stem cell transplant from 1996 to 2009, and then from 2009 to 11. And the first subgroup, they um, didn't select patients out for, for high-risk cardiac features, and the second group, they did. And they defined high, very high risk 
is not just an elevated NT Pro BNP. Remember, for the staging, I said it was over 1,800. This is over 5,000. And the, pro, the uh, troponin T wasn't just over 0.025, it was over 0.06. If patients had either of those, they were, they were plucked out. They weren't given a transplant. And in fact, the difference in treatment-related mortality between the two groups dropped from 10.5% to 1%. Um, and this is actually confirmed in um, one of the other major centers in the U.S., Boston University, had similar numbers when they used the selection criteria. When they also looked at the, the overall, or excuse me, the five-year overall survival for the, the subgroup of patients in this over 500 uh, uh, patient uh, population who got a stem cell transplant, if they plucked out those in both groups who uh, didn't have high-risk features, they had an over 70% five-year survival. So there is no randomized trial to prove that stem cell transplant improves survival, but it's very suggestive. You gotta be very selective, though, is the point. That's a take-home message for that. And finally, the last slide here is uh, the newest uh, kid in the block, if you will, is daratumumab. So daratumumab is a monoclonal antibody against CD38, which is expressed on plasma cells and stem cell precursors. Um, we know this drug has very high activity in myeloma. And in fact, in relapsed and refractory AL amyloid, it had a lot of efficacy. So there was a randomized trial called the Andromeda trial. I don't remember what that stands for. And that was published at a national meeting just a couple months ago. Almost 400 patients with previously untreated AL were randomized open label to CyberD versus CyberD plus daratumumab given subcutaneously. And they had a higher response rate, better renal and cardiac responses at six months, and better major organ progression-free survival. So that actually led to the FDA granting it FDA approval about two or three weeks ago. And we just started a patient on it ourselves. So that's the newest drug on the scene. Okay, take home points. Um, remember that for AL amyloid, the symptoms are often nonspecific, and because of that, that can result in long delays in diagnosis. Um, if I gave this talk 20 years ago, it would be kind of, hmm, well, that's interesting, but who cares? There's nothing to treat them with. I mean, we didn't really have anything but maldex. I would argue it's really changed pretty dramatically in the last decade. So you don't want to miss making a diagnosis because there are new treatment options which have resulted in prolonged survivals, but you've got to select the right patients to be treated. Um, so who should you consider AL amyloid in? Well, uh, I would say there's four scenarios you want to keep in mind clinically, clinical scenarios. One is, again, a non-diabetic with nephrotic range proteinuria. Two is somebody with CHF or unexplained fatigue who on echo has a restrictive cardiomyopathy, particularly with preserved EF. Three is unexplained hepatomegaly. And four is somebody with idiopathic peripheral neuropathy. You just can't explain it. Keep these this in mind. If they have one of these and you can't figure out why they have it, the evaluation should include starting with an SPEP and serum IFE, 24-hour UPEP, and 24-hour urine IFE, and a serum-free light chain assay. Those screening tests for an underlying monoclonal plasma cell disorder are virtually 100% sensitive. If you find a monoclonal protein, you gotta do a bone marrow aspirin biopsy to prove it's amyloid and also to rule out myeloma. Um, if after getting a bone marrow and, or a fat pad biopsy, there's still no evidence for amyloid, then you gotta biopsy an organ usually go where the money is by up to the affected organ. And I think that's all I got. And that's the CME code. Any questions? How do I see if there's a question? Yeah, hold up. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. So at this time, feel free to post uh, any questions in the chat. Dr. Zacharias had a comment. And then there was a one question. Yeah. So, Zacharias, for patients with suspected ATTR, I would recommend starting with a, a technician pyrophosphate scan and then, if positive, no true biopsy. Then go directly to genetic testing. Good. Good to hear that because that's what I, I think that's what I say. Uh, Hillard. Hillard Lazarus, thank you for a quick question, Hillard. Go Steelers. Uh, fantastic talk. Can you comment on cardiac conduction um, disturbances and how to proceed? Yeah, I mean, you can definitely see that. And you can see um, arrhythmias, both Brady and tachyarrhythmias in patients with 
um, AL amyloid and driving the heart. Um, how to proceed? Uh, I'm, I don't. I don't have any specific comments in terms of treatment management. I would get, um, you know, cardiology colleagues involved very early in those in those cases. Um, Some centers have advocated uh, for pro placement of a, you know, a basing device prophylactically. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know the data on that, Hillard. I'd have to check with my cardiology con uh, colleagues on that one. Great talk. Thank you. Any other questions out there? Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Brien. This was an excellent talk. Um, we have recorded it, so if anybody needs the recording, feel free to send me an email. And make sure you make note of the CME code 43348. Thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon.